Okay, so why don't I get us started? So uh, we just heard from uh, different perspectives around student researchers. We'll now hear uh, from the university academic perspective. And uh, chairing this session, it's my pleasure to introduce you to one of our very own, Professor Ikechi Mgbioji. As you can see in the bio, he holds a litany of uh, different awards and prizes. Summa cum laude from uh, Dalhousie grad. And I'm so glad that we were able to scoop you up from the University of British Columbia in 2003. And uh, he's now uh, one of our esteemed faculty members. And uh, with that, Professor Mgbioji to chair this panel. So thank you, Ketchi. Thank you very much, uh, Pina. And, uh, to everyone, please welcome back to uh, this second panel. Uh, without um, further ado, I suppose I should just uh, make a quick introduction of the um, panelists here. Uh, to my immediate right, of course, is um, Dr. Phipps. Um, Dr. Phipps uh, is uh, flanked by his very good colleague, Stavatore. And then, of course, at the very extreme end there is, of course, uh, Sean Connor. Now, um, they are going to, they're going to be addressing various uh, topics all related to the central theme of uh, you know, how the academic environment in the university you know, impacts on uh, uh, um, students' uh, ability to innovate and to push things from the, 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 the university environment to the marketplace. Needless to say, this is a very, 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 very um, um, topical issue, uh, particularly in Canada, where there is very little in terms of uh, statutory guidance as to what happens or what should happen. So in many cases, we have universities more or less on their own devising the various rules of engagement if they so care. And most of them have actually you know, shown some, some serious degree of care. Um, of course, this is a little bit more different from what obtains in the US, where one could point to a few uh, statutory provisions, for example, the by the Act, which does make some references or some provisions as to what obtains when uh, you know, uh, inventions arise from the ac 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 academic or university environment. And of course, uh, 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 even though we may not have any uh, kind of uh, legal framework, so to speak, in terms of a such provision. That does not mean that we have not in Canada had experiences of cases where students have actually come forth with uh, numerous kinds of inventions that have been quite topical. I remember, uh, I think, 18 months ago when I was teaching the uh, patent course at the PDP downtown, one of my students, a very mature woman, uh, came to me and said, oh, my daughter is doing something with one of her, her, her friends in school. They have come up with this invention. I said, well, what is it about? She said, oh, uh, they are able to um, uh, uh, um, take uh, f f photographs of bacteria and other bacterial specimens via the cell phone camera. I said, oh, that's interesting. And of course, immediately, the thought occurred to all of us that, look, this could actually be very useful to uh, people in countries where it is so expensive to buy uh, uh, the microscope. And of course, in the, in the news last week, it was quite out there that this particular invention had, you know, the patent had been granted, and it is out there to be, uh, to, to be utilized. In fact, when she, met, you know, when she mentioned that, I said, oh, I could link you up to uh, one of uh, my friends who is a patent agent in a law firm uh, who wouldn't charge you an arm and a leg to get the, the, the invention patented. But the point I'm making here is that there is, in fact, this is not just a question of talking, 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 that there are things happening there within the academic and university environment. So these issues that we're going to be discussing today are quite, quite uh, helpful. So without further ado, I will let um, Mark Phipps and um, his, uh, his, his very close uh, colleague, Salvatore, who I understand they will be tag teaming, okay? I know most of us have watched wrestling matches on TV, you know, when you have uh, tag teams, you know, when... <laughs> so... Okay, so... So, Mark and Sal, over to you. Great. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. I'm going to start out by um, quickly telling you my story because I've kind of, um, like Joni Mitchell, seen it from both sides now. In that I, I started out um, my journey in, into intellectual property as a postdoc. I was working in the Toronto hospital system. And through the postdoc work, we identified what might have been a novel marker of HIV infection, a very rapid um, response marker for HIV infection. So we said, well, this looks interesting. So we took it to the vice president of um, research at the Toronto hospitals who said, well, because this was in 1995, <clears throat> um, sorry, 1993, and they didn't have a tech transfer office then, take it to the University of Toronto Innovations Foundation, which was the tech transfer office. So they patented on the, uh, they filed a patent on the um, technology, and we started marketing. And because I was the one of the inventors, one of two inventors on the technology, I got to see the tech transfer system from the side of an inventor and, and, and a postdoc inventor, so not, not a faculty inventor. And, um, and I remember it very clearly, and so we licensed it. We made a wee little bit of money, but um, this was the time when PCR and, um, and uh, Western Blots were coming in, and, and it, was a, it was a technology that didn't uh, make it in the marketplace. So we didn't make a lot of money, but made a wee little bit of money, and I remember the day very clearly. It was Easter Sunday. Um, I got a phone call from the person who was managing my portfolio on Easter Sunday. <laughs> And she said, I'm leaving um, Innovations Foundation. I'm going to turn your portfolio over to th this other guy. And I said, OK, well, get a life, because it's Easter Sunday. But I took that opportunity to walk into the president of Innovations Foundation on the Monday. And I said, well, Eileen is Eileen Utterson. This is her name. She's leaving. And he went, what? Because she hadn't told him yet. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but I said, you need me. And so I left the lab and I joined, the, um, left the bench and I joined Tech Transfer. And I worked there for a few years and I worked, um, and, and I had then some su successive experiences that led me to recognize a broader understanding of how of the um, social impacts that, that research can make. And so I ended up at the Canadian Arthritis Network. I remember day four on the job, I was the director of um, business development, so business development. And day four on the job, I was um, meeting with faculty members who were in the theme that was looking at uh, methodologies and outcomes. So we're looking at community outcomes of, of um, arthritis. And, and I'm up there going blah, blah, patents and blah, blah, and, and, um, and commercialization and bench to bedside. And, and Elizabeth Badley at the University Health Network said, most of our patients don't see a bedside. Most of our patients are in the community. Why, we're never going to file patents coming out of the research that's coming out of these, in CIHR's um, words, uh, population of public health and health services and health, health systems and health policy work. And so uh, what are you going to do for us? was kind of their challenge to this tech transfer guy. So we had to start thinking around how we can um, broaden our notions of, of impact of university research. And, and um, I remember an application for funding from someone at UBC, Deanne Lakai, who worked with um, employers. And she was working with employers and human resource policies so that people with arthritis could stay employed in the workplace longer. And there was no intellectual property, like no patents that would come out of that work. But when we were assessing uh, when we were assessing uh, for funding her application, we had a square that says commercialization and intellectual property, and it got clicked zero. And I went, but no, you know, we, we need to find other ways of articulating value that is in addition to um, intellectual property. And then I ended up at the SCIHR and um, was involved with a group that has ended up being the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research. And they were looking at how health research in Canada can help narrow the health disparities between the global north and the global south. Again, never resulting in a patent. So. Um, my message here is that universe, that patents and commercialization are really important tools for, you, for um, bridging university research to outcomes and to impacts, but they're not the only tool that we have. And so given that ground or that, that background, um, I was thinking about, you know, I, we're here to talk about the, uh, the university's perspective. So York, you know, who's read York's mission statement lately? Wow. Yay. Uh, the first sentence says that um, the mission of York University is the pursuit, the preservation, and the dissemination of knowledge. And dissemination is a necessary, well, that, that's where it stops. And I want to say that dissemination is a necessary precursor to impact. That if we don't disseminate our knowledge, and that's teaching, and that's publication, and that's patenting, and licensing, and commercialization. If we don't use these, all these tools for dissemination, then we're not going to be able to maximize the impact of the research at York University. 
And also, uh, who's, who's actually been to the strategic plan, uh, the re strategic research plan consultations? All your hands should go up. Yay. Um, and it's, there's a commitment in the, in the draft strategic research plan to translate the results of research into action. And this includes in that plan knowledge mobilization, supports for innovation York and commercialization, and enabling the social entrepreneur. So in the draft strategic research plan in the mission statement of York, dissemination is embedded within those. So I, I just really want to say from the university's perspective that dissemination, including the dissemination of intellectual property, is absolutely integral to the fabric of York University. And IP is one of these ways that we do this. And commercialization of IP at York is a service. It's not, so we've set up Innovation York as a service unit, not a profit center. And let me tell you, we're really good at not making a profit. <clears throat> we do that very well. But if we make the right choices, then profit and purpose are not incompatible. But it's, it's, it's the drivers behind your, your service that, um, are, that you make the first decision. So for example, we've got examples of spin-off companies. Razia, thank you very much, that's awesome. Um, and I referenced a couple of others in my comments, so Engage Biomechanics, Palomino Innovation Systems, um, uh, New Mindset. So we've got some examples of spin-off companies, but we've also got examples of working with Christine Jonas Simpson. She's in the School of Nursing, and she produced videos, and we call them the bereavement videos. She produces videos that help families who have just lost a child. And these videos are not, and, we, and Innovation York has supported the distribution, quote, commercialization of these videos. But it's not about making money. It's about making a difference. And so the, the, the types of intellectual properties that we are looking at supporting and commercializing and distributing and disseminating are very broad uh, within Innovation York. And that broad perspective also, um, um, also refers to the knowledge mobilization that I referred to in my comments earlier this morning. And because we view our, re we want to be able to maximize the social, the cultural, the environmental, and the economic impacts of university research. And one of the ways we do this is through patenting and commercialization. Another way we do this is through knowledge mobilization. York is the first university in Canada to have developed a knowledge mobilization unit that's fully integrated into the research infrastructure. And because of the work that we've done over the last six years, we've helped involve, we've helped inform the cooling policies for two and a half million Torontonians. We've helped York Region deliver, develop an innovative way of delivering immigrant settlement services through the welcome centers in York Region. And that's helped create 86 jobs and it's delivered 48,000 services to newcomers in York Region over five years. The work that we've done has helped turn the Youth Emergency Shelter Peterborough into a social enterprise and has helped launch the Green Economy Center that brings um, green business services to the rural economies of South Simcoe. All of these projects involve students. Some of them involved only students. And uh, it's, it's when we start looking at the role of students in intellectual property, that's patenting, and also the other values that research can bring, it's, we realize um, that this is really important to the university, and that's why the university is making investments in Innovation York and in our relationships with Venture Lab and other organizations that are going to be our partners in moving this work forward. At York, IP is owned by the creator that was mentioned in the first panel. Thank you, Razia, for pointing that out. Um, and faculty and student inventors can choose to commercialize, as, as Razia said. The role of Innovation York is to support that, and we make that decision based on three things. It's when the research is right, when the opportunity, so that means the market and the, and the partners are right, and when the researcher is right. And, and we line, when those three line up, that's when there's an opportunity for us to form a collaboration with our faculty members or with the students or with our faculty members and students to be able to become the agent of that technology and commercialize that. And that comes to a really important point that was mentioned in the first panel, is we help identify who the inventors are, because inventors, inventorship is a matter of law. It's not a matter of wish or desire. Inventorship is a matter of law, and if you don't get it right, your patent can be invalidated. It can be challenged based on inventorship. So we work with our, um, we help identify these owners and, and inventors, and I'm going to turn it over to Saul shortly to say that, to talk about how the Office of Research Services and the Faculty Graduate Studies help support our faculty and students in helping identify who are inventors and who are owners. I'm not going to go, take too much time in going into who, what the definitions of inventors, owners, and 
authors. Just to say that um, an inventor by definition is also an owner of the patent, but the inventors can recognize the non-inventive contributions of other people, and they may be faculty or graduate students or research um, associates, through either making them owners, and that's through a contractual relationship, or by recognizing them in, in, in distribution of the value stream that comes in. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Sal, who's gonna talk about some of the work that's underway in grad studies. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so we heard this morning from, from the panel in terms of the student perspective, and I think that perspective speaks a lot to what I'm going to discuss with respect to the work that I do as the research officer in the Faculty of Graduate Studies. So we work, my, our office, David's office, um, a lot on issues of intellectual property, research agreements, these sorts of, these sorts of ideas. And oftentimes what I, what I want to do is I want to share some of the common issues that graduate students have expressed and that, that really starts our conversation and they echo what both Udo and um, Razavi mentioned this morning. Um, so I, I took these directly from conversations that I've had but also emails and real, real examples that we deal with just to give a flavor for, for what it is that graduate studies helps to support, where we start, the starting point of our discussions. So I'm the inventor. The company just gave me the space to work and paid me. These are my ideas. What do you mean I can't use them? I have to write my dissertation. Did I just waste? Me? Yeah, they're doing, they're, you know, they are. They, they're passionate, right? It's about passion. It's where passion meets emotion. It was something that you mentioned earlier. And, and the need to talk about, um, to, to give students a space to, to pre present that passion and then move forward on how we're going to deal with some of the, the consequences. But, you know, how am I going to write my dissertation? Did I just waste two years of my life? Um, what, the company is going to make money off of my ideas and I don't get any financial compensation. What, is that? what does that mean? My supervisor is insisting that she's the first author, she's the inventor, but I did all the work. Why can't I use my research findings to publish an article? Um, what do you mean I have to keep these things confidential? How will I finish my research project? Those are the starting points. And it's about where students will begin to start a conversation. Do they, are they asking questions? Um, these are the consistent problems that we see, um, that I see in the Faculty of Graduate Studies when I'm working with students. But it's not only students that raise these specific issues. Faculty researchers will raise the same types of issues in the opposite perspective, right? So to get to your point, Udo, a faculty member believes that they're the, they're, they're the primary inventor and the student believes that they're not. What our offices do, what, 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 what we do in graduate studies is we try and balance those varying viewpoints. And so we bring, I meet with students and faculty together when we're talking about intellectual property, when we're talking about research agreements. But it's about having those conversations before the research starts. Not after you've done two years of research as part of a, a research project with a company and a supervisor. It's about having those conversations, asking certain questions. And the three questions that, that I think are the most important, given my experiences in graduate studies, I'm going to share those with you. Am I being paid for this research? And who is paying me? Am I conducting this research as an employee of the university or as part of a company project or both or some variation? Am I expecting to publish these findings? Do I want to be the co-author? Do I want to be a primary author? Do I want to ultimately write my dissertation on the research that I've done? Second question. The third question, do I want to be considered the inventor or the co-inventor? And that speaks to what David started talking about in terms of who is the primary inventor, who is the co-inventor. We need, we need students to ask these questions. And it's about a dialogue between the Faculty of Graduate Studies, the graduate programs and the students and the faculty supervisors. If we start there with those questions, those questions will lead to research agreements. And so what we deal with, what I deal with mostly in the Faculty of Graduate Studies are research agreements between students, supervisors, companies, but also tri-council agencies. So there are, I'll give you one example, NSERC IPS, Industrial Partnership Scholarships, um, where NSERC will provide a portion of the funding the student will work on a research project under the supervision of their supervisor, but on site at a company. So they have access to company information, they have access um, to all sorts of resources and this kind of thing. It's about students thinking about what they want to do when they're there and where they want to go. So I, I really resonate, Rez, uh, Rezavi, with your, sorry, did I get your name right? 
Your name, did I get Res it right? Res. I really resonate with your story and you too, Udo, in terms of wanting to do your dissertation work, but doing this research as part of um, not only your researcher's grant, but as part of a, a company. So there's those three questions lead into the research agreements. Maybe this is a good point to to move it back to you because you're going to talk a little bit about those research agreements. Yeah, th there. Thanks. Thank you, Saul. Um, there are three t ways that students get involved in funded research. Um, one is where, kind of like you mentioned, uh, where the student is known and where there are terms and conditions. For every NSERC IPS, there is an IP agreement that the student signs and that the company signs. And that's done up front, and then the university signs. So, so that's, that's kind of the easy one, because Sal sits down, has the conversation with the student, has a conversation with the faculty member, and, and is engaged with the company. So the NSERC IPS, where the student is known and the terms and conditions are known. What is more frequent is where the student isn't known, but the term terms and conditions are. So that's when we have a research contract with a third party organization who's contracting with York and a faculty member, but the faculty member doesn't know which student they're going to bring on. And so you don't have the opportunity at that time. At that time. To talk with um, uh, uh, to talk with uh, with the students. However, actually, I'm going to back up and say, outside of the NSERC IPS, when there is a company contract that involves a known student who's an author, we send all those to you. Yep. So, so the Office of Research Services through Innovation York, which negotiates those contracts, Sal has gets a copy of all of those and has a chance to loop in with the students to explain all of all of the rights. So, so FGS is the advocate for the student in all of these um, in all of these uh, conversations. Hey, let me just let me just interrupt you for a minute. The, the conversations that we have are always student, supervisor, FGS. So we bring those parties in together at the same time so that we're having a consistent so that conversation so that we're all on the same page. Yeah. Let me just put it back. And so for when we know the terms and conditions but we don't know the student, the faculty member gets the money, faculty member is going to employ a student off that um, off the, the money that's sitting in the faculty member's account. And the, the student, this is where the student needs to be aware enough to say who's funding this work and are there any terms and conditions that will limit m um, my right to intellectual property or my right to publish. Um, we actually never sign an agreement that limits rights to publish. We will sign an agreement that will delay publication until we can file intellectual property rights, but we will never enter into an agreement that, that, um, remo that, um, that prohibits publication. And so what we advocate is that the students and the faculty members actually have a clear and transparent understanding in their labs as to what are the, um, what are the rights that are accruing to the student. John Sotsos, for example, he's in computer science and engineering, has an upfront agreement with every student who comes into the lab that outlines who's going to own what and on what basis are those decisions going to be made. So no student walks into John Sotsos' lab without having that made up front. And that, that, gets, um, that just gets it done with at the beginning, and so we don't have to clean it up afterwards. And then the third type is where the student isn't known and there are no terms and conditions. And that's something like a tri-council research grant. So if a faculty member's got a CIHR grant, employs a student, and then coming out of that, there might be some intellectual property that's disclosed to Sheldon in Innovation New York or to Sheldon's group. That's where we again loop in FGS if we, if there's, a, so first question we ask is who are the inventors? Second question we ask is are there any students involved? We don't ask are there any student inventors, we ask are there any students involved? Because that's our cue to say FGS, we need to bring in, we need to provide an advocate for the students in this conversation. Once we identify who the students are, then we move to who are really the inventors. And as the case with Razia showed, her supervisor wasn't an inventor. Razio was the inventor. So we, we help the students have those conversations, but the trigger for that is the, is the IP, the invention disclosure to Innovation New York. Do you want to add anything more? Um, one of the things that, that we see often are, are just the disagreement. I want to come back to the disagreements between supervisors and graduate students, because the reality is they do exist. They happen all the time. Um, and students need to know, I agree with you, Udo, that it is an education piece that maybe should be mandated, but, but it's a definitely an education piece that needs to exist. And so we, we do a lot of work with students and with supervisors. It's about, it's about sharing that information and those opportunities with your colleagues and with people around the institution, that there are, there are resources um, that are dedicated to this kind of, this kind of work. So I just 
So just to summarize our part, um, is York values IP. We value IP as one way of creating impacts from our investments in research. And York has invested in the services of the Faculty of Graduate Studies and of Innovation York to help manage this IP in an accountable and a transparent system. And now we're able, because we've made those investments and we've got a system that's working, we're now able to tell the stories of our success, like Razia here today. So we're, we're now at a point where we're able to start telling the success because we've got the right systems in place because we valued the IP in the first place. Thank you very much, David and Sal. Uh, Sean? Uh, clicker, so I can have some slides. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give the south of the border perspective, uh, which actually is fairly congruent. So there'll be a lot of uh, overlap. So I'll minimize the overlap points and just point back to you guys for that, uh, and then just pull out some of the differences. Um, Another thing I should note, I should have put it on the slide, but I was the lead author of uh, National Academy of Sciences um, report, Legal Context of University IP and Tech Transfer for the US, and so I can send out that link if anybody wants it. What I think was, was particularly important about that report was that we didn't just cover the patent piece and, and the Baidol law in the US, but we looked at all the you know, copyright, trade secret, secret, and also tax issues, and sovereign immunity, and there's a whole host of things that, and I don't know if I'll be able to stay for the whole industry panel in the afternoon, but there's, there's a lot of tension points. It's not just faculty and students, students and university, but it's also industry, and, and it's, you know, universities really have a lot of, at least in the US, and probably up here, they're in a web of laws and regulations that, that extend far beyond just the, the obvious IP ones. So I think everyone needs to keep that in mind when we're looking at how industry, students, and faculty can work together to commercialize. Okay, so the three themes uh, that I want to touch on today are recognition of students as inventors. That's a, a key issue. Uh, you know, when they, um, are they uh, inventors? Okay, when can they be inventors? And then separate from that is who gets to own it? So even if they are inventors, where does the ownership lie? Uh, and then uh, finally, students as commercializers. Okay, so I think we've heard uh, a couple of times today that yes, it's, it seems true that there are at least some PIs out there who are hostile to the notion that uh, uh, students can be inventors. Uh, now that's, uh, to give a little bit of credit to the PI though, there is that sense of, look, I have an overall research agenda that I've gotten funded to do. And I bring in you know, students and they help and I bring in lab techs and other things. But you know, I am the sort of but for me and but for my vision, this thing wouldn't be going forward at all. Okay, so, so be a little sympathetic to where they're coming from, uh, and they sort of feel like, look, I just trained this kid a, a year ago, right, and he can't be inventive. Now, of course, that's short-sighted on their part, but, you know, there, there's something, uh, there's a little something to it. You can be somewhat sympathetic to their position, okay? Now, uh, the flip side of this is for the students who then start leading their own projects and then are being inventive, you're going to be in the same position soon, too, because you're going to have lackeys under you. You're going to get people that, you know, either at the company or maybe even the university setting, and you're going to be thinking the same thing. This is my project, right? I, I am the, the guiding force of this. So we all have to be a little careful of that. Um, but as David you know, so accurately pointed out, uh, you're in Canada and I know for the US, inventorship is a matter of law. So no matter what everyone thinks and who the guiding force was and who got the grant, at the end of the day, for the patent office, it has to be who the inventors are. And I mentioned here in the US, there's the famous Chu versus Ch Chicago case, which is, is fairly well known in tech transfer circles because it was the issue where you had a, a grad student, she was left off the patent application. Now there there was, it is one of the you know ugly stories I don't say it's representative of a lot of the relationships, but at least this one did happen where she had been talking to the um, PI about, uh, gee, I think we have something inventive here, and he blatantly said, no, we don't, and went ahead and filed the patent application anyway. So, uh, so it's a really juicy case. You know, it's not just uh, uh, you know, <laughs> leaving the inventor off, but it's like fraud allegations and misuse of funds and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so it's basically a cautionary tale. But the interesting wrinkle of that in the US was the question of whether the student had standing to sue for inventorship because in the US, and I'll get to this in a moment, you generally have, if you're doing paid research work, then you are assigning your inventions over ahead of time. Okay, uh, so in that case then the question was does she have standing because she'd already pre-assigned the invention away. But when it got to the federal circuit, our, our appellate court for mm -hmm. patents, then they said, well, but because of the Baidol law that basically mandates when there's federal funding, 
even though you know, we'll assign over the invention to the university, the inventors still have a right to some portion of the licensing proceeds. So she still had a, she still had a financial interest in it, uh, and so they decided it there. In dicta, they did have an interest in common about would her reputation in being named on a patent for uh, you know, getting jobs and other things, would that be enough of a tangible interest for her? Okay, so I'm just gonna you know, leave it at that because again, we, we've covered this issue fairly well already. Now, ownership of it, uh, I've just alluded to, in the U.S., this is uh, something that's going to be fairly different from Canada, and Pete and I were having a good discussion about this, uh, because, uh, you know, even though we're, we're both sort of um, coming from the, from the British common law uh, tradition, it shakes out fairly differently, and that the U.S., it's, it's accepted that you can pre-assign your inventions. And I don't mean that you just have a contractual obligation to assign them later. And so this was the Stanford v. Roche case that some of you probably followed uh, uh, in the U.S. The question there, especially at the federal circuit level, was when you have the language that says, I hereby agree to assign, that means you've only established a contractual obligation. And so the person who's obligated to assign it now can essentially breach the contract, and then you can go after them for breach of contract, but you might not get the, the patent ownership back as opposed to where you write the language just by saying, I hereby assign, and you're still assigning stuff that doesn't even exist yet. And so this is the difference with Canada, where there is that the sense going back to some of the old common law principles that, well, you can't assign stuff that doesn't exist yet. All right? So in the US, we've come down fairly differently on that. Okay. Now, the factors that we look at, it sounds like they're fairly similar, uh, because students are in a unique position in that you are in a, in a degree program. You're paying tuition to, uh, to be there. Okay, so the factors that a lot of U.S. universities look at is, you know, are you working that employed capacity? Okay, uh, or are you using university facilities? So a lot of U.S. universities are really rethinking a lot of their policies vis-a-vis -vis students right now. And certainly if you are working in a paid position, Okay, then you will, in most of the cases, be assigning over, pre-assigning over all your inventions. But the, the trickier one now is some universities are making a move to say, even if you're just using university facilities, that then you're gonna have to assign over your inventions. And that's much more controversial. But again, some universities are, are going for that. Now, countervailing uh, that, okay, that the, the students should assign over their inventions, is this notion that, well, if you're paying tuition, right, for that course, or even for your thesis, right? You're paying for those credits, then you shouldn't have to assign it over. And related to that, if you're doing uh, uh, work that if it's a mandatory class for your degree program, then you shouldn't have to assign over that as well. So we're trying to, and it's difficult to do, but we're trying to demarcate away this, okay, when are you acting as a paid researcher and when are you acting as a student? But as we all know, that's, those lines can be quite blurry. Okay. So then my uh, uh, final point is just a little bit on uh, students as commercializers. I don't think we haven't uh, really touched on this directly in the way I want to touch on it, which is that in the U.S., uh, a number of schools, including my own, the University of Washington, we have teams of law students and MBA students, in my case, you know, working together to then help uh, commercialize and do, do spin-offs. So they help the tech transfer office then, you know, giving essentially free labor, which is a beautiful thing, right, to uh, the tech transfer office to help the faculty members and students who are commercializers to think about how to do the spin-off. But there is some one major conflict of interest there, which is especially for the lawyers and the law students. If it looks like we are essentially having the faculty or the other, the engineering students or science students, as our clients, we can't be negotiating on their behalf as against the university, right? It's kind of straightforward conflict, but it has meant that in a lot of situations, universities have not done this, what I think is a very useful service of having the law and MBA students help in the commercialization process. My argument has been, well, yes, we leave that to the side and we make it clear to the students, the student clients and the faculty clients, that that's the one thing we don't touch. They'll have to get an outside attorney to help them do that license with the university. Of course, that's one of the main things they want, but again, we just, that's too much of a conflict of interest. There's lots of other stuff we can help them with, helping them think about the kind of entity they'll commercialize through, think about tax issues, you know, think about all sorts of things, okay? So, um, one, one other challenge with this is that uh, when we've had some student teams trying to help commercialize, they went into the situation thinking that the tech transfer office had committed the license to their to-be-formed venture. 
and this you know, expectations were not properly managed. And so in a number of cases then, Tech Transfer ultimately, because it was within their discretion to do it, decided they had a better or more appropriate licensing opportunity with say a big established company or something else other than the student team. And the student team was fairly offended by this because they'd spent a year putting together a business plan, getting together potential investors, and then the whole thing kind of went up in a, in a puff of smoke. Uh, but this is again, is just the education point, is that if everyone's made aware of these issues, the conflict of interest, when you have law students and MBA students working essentially on behalf of other students to help them think about the spinoff, there's that potential conflict with they can't be negotiating against the university. And then the separate issue that needs to be dealt with is the students, generally MBAs or engineering students who are trying to create the spinoff, if they uh, are not educated to the fact that they, might, that they don't have rights to the license, that the tech transfer office is willing to consider licensing to them, but at the end of the day, tech transfer will have to make that decision. That's right, so all stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, before we um, go on for questions, I'd just li like us to give a round of applause to our panelists. I think they've done a very good job with their talk. So. Um, I think now is time for questions. But before we go on to questions, I, I suppose that David would want to say some few words. Yeah, I, I, and something just occurred to me that we haven't talked about, which is undergrads, right. undergrad students, and who is the voice and the support for undergrads? And, um, and so most of these would arise out of coursework. And I'm thinking of the fourth year engineering students who um, build stuff you know, as, as part of their project. And so there could be an invention out of there. The Innovation York in the Office of Research Services certainly would take an invention disclosure from undergrads, but who on campus would play your role? for undergrads that you play for grad students, and I don't know the answer to that. So, and there may not be, you play a mediation role between grad students and supervisors within a course context, that conflict or dialogue may not sit there, and certainly if there was a conflict or a dispute between students on the team, then we've got academic and non-academic um, dispute resolution folks on campus. I'm thinking as I do this, so there, there might be a, a way of helping them out there. But I do know when I was at um, Innovation, um, Innovations Foundation at U of T, one of the very attractive um, um, and exciting technologies that was disclosed to us was a group of undergrads. And it was a way of making IP addresses available in non-just alpha um, Roman alphanumeric um, numerals, but having characters, including characters in Farsi and Mandarin um, um, being able to be read in IP addresses. And so, um, because I've not seen any IP addresses that don't have Roman alphanumeric numerals, I've assumed the technology didn't go anywhere, but it was, uh, we had companies and investors jumping on that technology, and that was in the late 90s. And it was a group of students who came together, and it wasn't out of coursework, but they came to us and said, what do we do with this? So the undergraduate student, is it something we should also consider? Thank you very much. Last question? Okay. I, I can just be loud. <laughs> <laughs> the other group that um, we've been finding um, some challenges with, uh, in addition to undergrads, um, is postdocs. And that's because, especially in the last three years, the status of postdocs um, has been clarified um, by the Canada Revenue Agency um, and at most universities that they're now employees of the universities instead of getting a stipend um, or some other um, funding. So I was just wondering, um, Professor O'Connor and, 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 uh, um, and York, if you could clarify how you deal with postdocs, if you deal with them more like faculty, more like students, or more like staff. Well, again, and this is just broad brushstrokes for the U.S. because obviously each university uh, does its own policies, but uh, a lot of them are teaching, uh, treating postdocs as employees. So basically, if you're drawing a check from the university and you're getting health benefits or access to health benefits, then you're being treated as an employee and you're assigning things over. Now, that's in it. That's in a Bayh-Dole world where, yeah, yeah, where assignment US, right? is, yeah. is required. We don't have a Bayh-Dole Act in Canada, and therefore um, we consider employees to be bound by our policies, which is inventor-owned. So the postdoc would then make a decision to engage the services of Innovation York or not, and then we would do an evaluation, make a decision to engage um, in a commercialization opportunity with the postdoc. So it, 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 um, because we are not 
if we, I could see the challenge being, um, and if you're in a um, non vital inventor institution owned scenario where the postdoc was not considered an employee and used to be able to own, and now they're an employee and now they have to assign, I could see that being a conflict, but we haven't experienced that conflict because we're not, we're an inventor owned. Uh, I have a question here for uh, Sean. There's been much um, <coughs> interest in filing of patents by students, be they postdoc, graduates, or undergrad. Now, uh, but the question that I want to ask is, what in law makes a person an inventor or co-inventor? I mean, obviously, um, giving your supervisor a hand or helping him or her with some reagents or carrying water or carrying his or her books uh, surely wouldn't count as yeah. a So I'd like you to. Well, and it's so hard because you, know, you can't do it in any kind of quantifiable way. So you've got this horrible kind of standard that's basically, uh, you know, if you've made a, anyone who's made a substantial contribution to the conceptualization, you know, the concept of the invention. And we have in the US, and you probably have it up here too, that distinction between uh, conceiving the invention and reducing it to practice. So we just, we have the standard that sounds good, you know, it seems conceptually coherent, but how do you actually test that in practice? Uh, and so what does it mean for someone to have done a substantial contribution to the concept? Well, one of the problems is you gotta figure out what the invention is first. And that can be a little bit tricky in that when the, the disclosure first comes in, as I'm sure happens for you guys all the time and all of our tech transfer people here, that there's a lot of refinement that happens to what the invention is. Now, as you do that refinement, it may change your view on who is actually contributing it to it. So until you know what the invention actually is and what the claims are, then you don't really know. Uh, now, we, we'd like to draw some, some clear lines that if somebody is, is it just kind of a lab technician and you know filling beakers or something like that, now, they're not contributing to it, but you know, that's, that's clear cut there, but it's very messy after that. I, I, I like to say that invention happens in the brain, not in the hands. So if, if what you were was a really skilled set of hands and the invention wouldn't have been reduced to practice without you, you're not an inventor. But if, um, and if, but if, you, if the inventive idea happened in your brain and you told the skill set of hands what to do and they did it, then you're still the inventor. So I, I try and, um, that, that's just the first by fabrication. Or that's that's a little bit of that tension, I think, between PIs and their uh, uh, students, right. in that, um, you know, it's this hindsight is twenty twenty. We all know this is a problem that plagues patents, in that the inventor, you know, let's say it's the PI, they had this grand vision for where the research was going in the lab. The students are adding something, but the, the PI may just naturally assimilate that in their head and think, oh yeah, that was always part of my idea. And one of the things that we see all the time, we know, is that ideas happen throughout the life cycle, right. throughout the entire project. So if, if you're engaged in a research agreement where the understanding was X at the beginning, it's about identifying how those ideas are changing, where they're coming from, and then revisiting the initial agreements that you, you signed on right. for. Um, there's no reason why students can't file amendments to those agreements, having conversations with us about how that changes. Right. Uh, hello, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Edgar Brown. Uh, I'm glad I came because this is one of the concerns that I have. I'm a history and a health studies major on the grad, but I also do hacking in my spare time. And uh, we had uh, an event recently at the Stacy Science and Engineering Library with uh, the Lassonde uh, as well and Dr. Yu uh, Chesser. And we're creating uh, codes for his uh, program and different. Uh, there was. It's, is it there? Hackfest? Hackfest, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Hackfest. Hackfest. Just click on it. It's second from the top, click on it. No, no, no. Okay. Stacy Library Dungeon Hackfest. Straight down from where you are. Oh, no. You're straight up a little bit. More, more, no, no. more. There yeah. You. And scroll down. Yeah, go scroll on to the pictures. I want to show the uh, the panelists something. Yeah, there's some pictures. There's uh, attachments down. No, no, no. Scroll down. Sure.
I want the audience to just quickly read the top of that. Because we're doing uh, faculty mapping, we're creating, uh, I was part of the uh, conception team that would create codes for the space program, uh, the machine to transmit and be compatible with Linux, uh, uh, Macintosh, and a whole host of uh, programs to be able to uh, transmit that to Earth immediately and in real time, as well as with uh, what Commander Hatfield is doing right now in space. Scroll down to the pictures so that you can see uh, That's our team, a lot of the, uh, the team. And that was my team uh, doing conception. Go scroll down, just scroll down. The faculty map, research mapping, that would be helpful to both graduate and undergraduate uh, students and postdocs, class optimizers. There's Dimitri, the leader for our uh, conception group. Uh, scroll down. There's Dr. Uchester, keep, keep going. And there it is, yeah, the CubeSat software hardware that we're, we're creating the code for. And you can keep scrolling, I'll just keep talking. One of the huge concerns was intellectual property. I was thinking in my mind, and the reason why I was thinking about that was I came across uh, Dr. Gisipina's, uh, there was York Lions, I, uh, she had an event, they had an event about York Lions and intellectual property. And I said, let me check this out because I don't want to create things and I'm not being rewarded financially or in terms of recognition and my team, the, the entire team that worked. A lot of us have concerns about that because we can do it and we can even apply, but what you're talking about in terms of uh, the legal and legislative concerns and who's catering to the undergraduate students because I, I respect graduate students and postgrads, but a lot of these guys are not even on our level. But there's no one catering to us because it seems like we're insignificant, but we can do some real damage and create some real recognition for the university as well and for ourselves. So we need to establish a facilitator in terms of what you have for the graduate students for us as undergraduates because uh, a lot of people don't know because when they see us or when they see me because they're like, you study history, what do you know about science? <laughs> I'm like, I'm a, I'm a human health and disease academic tutor with the Department of Science and Engineering, I'm a hacker, I know more. But it's, it's just funny that the interdisciplinary collaboration that Dr. Giuseppe talk, uh, the Agostino talked about, we, could, we have so much of that here and I'm glad to be at York at this time because I just, the future is just, I'm just excited and brimming. And when I come to this event and I see that uh, Dr. Phipps is talking about the potential for undergraduate uh, you know, collaboration and assistance, I'm like, thank you, my prayers are answered. So, yeah. uh, thank you very much. I mean, this is my first time I've seen a real life hacker. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy that you, know, that you guys are doing this kind of a wonderful thing. Thank you very much and welcome. So yeah. next question. Sorry, Sorry. If, I, if I could respond to that. So you're going into Hackfest, which um, I've, I've never been part of, but <laughs> It it's, feels like, it, just look in those pictures, it feels like it's fairly um, sort of open space. And one thing you might want to think of going into a hacking, a hack fest like that is having people agree to what the rules of engagement are. And, and we see a lot of um, open access and open source stuff happening. And, and you might want to consider um, op open access, open source as, as a means of protecting your invention but allowing it to be out there and, and more, more widely used and disseminated. And um, I know within, uh, within, within copyright then the Creative Commons is a way of, um, of recognizing creators um, but providing access. Um, Pina, does Creative Commons, can that work for, for code as well? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I would just say with, without necessarily, because if, you, if you're going to start going in with lockdown IP understandings, you might not get the benefit of the openness of the hack. So, but you still want to be able to recognize um, creators within that space. So, so maybe consider creating an, um, a, a, an openness, so, but so you create a space for it to be discussed, but you look at um, open access or creative commons type of um, licensing language. Let me just add a little more on that. Um, the ones that are normally used for software are the open source licenses like uh, GPL and Apache, and there's about three or four different ones. That they, and they actually came before Creative Commons. Similar idea, though, and you can kind of set. Well, with those, you know, you kind of you kind of buy it. When you choose that open source license, it has terms. And the only thing to watch for with that is downstream now, that code, it's going to be hard to, for anyone, even if you had an interest to, to kind of propertize it, try to make money off it. 
Uh, you've kind of put it out there in the world, but that may be the point of the hack fast that you just, in, in this way, you can protect it. So no one's going to be able to claim it and take it proprietary again. Thank you. And then, and of course, one thing which this does demonstrate quite clearly is the very collaborative nature of contemporary in innovation and invention. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a long time ago since inventors were hidden somewhere in the basement, working away all by themselves alone. Uh, the lone wolf inventor is more or less a little bit rare these days. You could see uh, his team exchanging ideas and then bringing forth new things. Okay, uh, next uh, question. Thank you. Sorry for keeping you waiting. That's okay, not a problem. Um, so I am a second year law student here, but my question stems from my time when I was doing my master's and I went through the tech transfer office when patenting my research. So my question is, you mentioned that students have questions, Sal, I believe you mentioned that, and you also mentioned that faculties have questions from the opposite perspective. And I can totally see why that is, because when students and faculty, they're involved in their research, that's all they know. So there's a huge gap of knowledge that I realized when I came to law school. And my question is to enhance that transparency and build trust between that PI student relationship. Would a info session for students and faculty, frequent info sessions, when what IP means, what invention means, do you think that would play a role and should institutions look into that as an option to enhance in, you know, transparency and trust? Yeah, um, really good point. Um, we've touched on education a number of times. Uh, we, we have in the past uh, held information sessions around IP and around working with industry, and it's students who show up. You know, it's not faculty members, it's students who show up. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. And right now with Innovation York, we've had, um, we, we've had some new blood in Innovation York, and so we're planning now the next um, calendar year's worth of, uh, of in information sessions. So we're gonna be working with FGS to make sure that the grad students are just as aware of these as the, as the faculty are. Yeah, I'm gonna add at University of Washington, we have, um a number of different things on campus. The engineering school has actually for a number of years run its own commercialization program essentially, meaning that uh, uh, faculty and students can then take this course. Uh, and it's a year long process, so it's actually multiple courses and takes them through all the things they need to know to, to think about commercializing. They can come to the clinic that I, that I have going and, and you know, they must be able to come to your clinic too, right? Or I don't want to. Right. And, yeah. and yeah. our, our fac, um, uh, Dean, Dean Kaczynski from our Lausanne School of Engineering just walked in. Good. And um, Dean Kaczynski, I believe that IP and business are going to be integrated into the student curriculum yeah. of engineering. Is that correct? Yes, that, that is true. Although, uh, what I view of it is slightly different. Could you come and use the mic, please? We're uh, yeah. simulcasting yes, for the millions in viewer <laughs> land. <laughs> <laughs> Pina asked me to say a few words at the end, so I will. But uh, indeed, uh, we, we are implementing it in the curriculum, but, but I'm not a big believer of uh, doing it in uh, the classroom. W what, what I prefer, and that's what we are going to do, is create a venture, uh, a venture capital fund and then give the money and tools to the young, to the, our students, and, and let them uh, run with it. Let's give them the tools and they are going to figure it out better than we, we would for them. Well, that's a great idea. We actually have a, a W fund was set up at, uh, at University of Washington and it does something similar where it's got money that then can be put into, uh, into projects. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the, the one that I was just mentioning was the faculty of engineering. Yeah, and then there's commercial. It, we almost have too many things going on now, and so that's not necessarily a good thing, uh, right? So we have business school has its own, you know, center for innovation and entrepreneurship, and they have a whole bunch of classes you can take. Engineering has its own program. We have stuff in the law school. So our next step now is to, like coordinate this a little better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I was really interested by the comment of the gentleman there uh, who participated in the Hackfest, and um, and also in the response by Dr. Phipps. You made you made reference in your response. Um, he he mentioned that he wanted to ensure that he would have the ability to to basically benefit from his invention uh, or from his code that that you know was developed as as part of this Hackfest. And in your response, you seem to steer him in a direction of open source and Creative Commons. Um, 
is that sort of um, the general approach to um, you know, student developed, or especially at the undergraduate level, source code uh, at York or any other universities in Canada? Is that something that actually, or do you, if, if he actually wants to make money out of this and he wants to sell it, he wants to license it to, you know, generally in the, in the, in the commercial sector, is that something that, you know, is he, would he be normally steered in the direction of Creative Commons and, and open source? It wouldn't be steered. Creative Commons and open source would be an option that would be presented. What I would do is, is, um, is, have a sit down and find out what are your goals out of this, understand what the hack fest is, and then understand, um, you know, try and, and work with each opportunity as it comes up. So we don't, we don't um, have a priori directions whether it's gonna be licensed, open access, um, startup company. It's really driven by the opportunities. And I say three things, it, you know, number one, by him. I'm calling you him. <laughs> you know, what do you want? What are your goals out of this? And, and, and then, when we understand your goals, what's the environment? Because if you're going into a hack fest and you've got code, um, you're not the only inventor of that code in that hack fest. So if you want to get a thing done and you want to write code, well maybe, you sh and you want to get money off this, well maybe going into a hack fest isn't the place to do that. So you know, we, we would, it, um, if you come to me after a hack fest, then, then there's different considerations that are being put into that. So I'd say um, the, the open access, um, just uh, hacking, not my thing, is um, it's a very open space. Is that right? Would that be fair to say? You don't hack on your, well, you do, well, maybe you do hack on your own, but did that thing that we saw, it was a, it was a collaboration, a no, collaborative hack. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I agree, of course it's open, <clears> but, but, but the results that can come out of those events uh, can have real commercial value, can, you know. Uh, and, um, and of course, you gotta make sure that the rights and obligations of everybody on the team who developed that is clearly laid out. You mentioned that, and I, I agree. Uh, but, you know, I think if, they, if, if the team decides that they wanna commercialize this and they actually wanna make money out of this, then uh, yeah, the better for them. And you know? then they could come to us and disclose yeah. it to us and we'll take a look at that just yeah. uh, you know, with any invention disclosure yeah. and um, we'll, we'll work with our partners. Jeremy Lauren is here from Venture Lab. Did you ever hack? No, you're a different kind of engineer. Um, but, but work with our partners to actually help bring that understanding of the technology opportunity in and help us make the right commercialization recommendations to the owners who are the people who actually at the end of the day are gonna make the decisions. Just as a detail add on to that. Um, the, uh, you know, we'll all keep in mind too that Creative Commons and, and GPL, these are all uh, copyright oriented licenses. So we have this challenge with software. I haven't kept up on it in, in the Canadian developments as much as in the US. You know, it's at least conceivably patentable, at least parts of it might be patentable. So, uh, copyright can protect it, and you can also try to protect it through trade secret. Uh, but you have to know going in what you want to do with that. And so uh, you know, if you use the Creative Commons and those, that is only going to get you the, the copyright part of it. No. Thank you very much uh, to all our participants, and of course to the presenters again. A round of applause for everyone.